Okay. All right, that's us. And I don't know where I put my. My clicker. Hi, everybody. We're starting the review right now. It's just a second to get organized in here. I'm going to try to talk as fast as I can. Lane, I'm very grateful you told me. Oh, Sam, don't hurt yourself. Sam's tripping. There we go. You be tripping. All right, here we go. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, does anybody want to wave and say hi? You, you can be famous. So this is the hi. peanut gallery. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, there's a lot. This is a hard couple units. I'm going to go as fast as I can. Um, take notes, shout out questions. You don't have to take notes on everything, just whatever you have a question about. Okay, so reminding you, we started first with enzymes. So just reminding you the look of what we call the reaction profile. The reactants are on the left, the products are on the right, and that hill shows you the amount of energy needed in order to make a reaction occur. And that's called the activation energy, and that's the height of the hill. And the whole idea is that um, enzymes lower the activation energy. So you need less energy if you have an enzyme present. So it says with exergonic reactions, the products end up lower on the graph than the reactants. So that's what this is a picture of, is exergonic. But with endergonic reactions, the products end up higher on the graph. So let's see if we can really quickly think is photosynthesis exergonic or endergonic? Endergonic, right? It's making this high energy molecule of glucose. And so it's storing the sun's energy. And so the glucose has a lot of energy stored inside of it, more energy than carbon dioxide does. But then the reverse would be um, when we're doing cell respiration and we take the energy out of it, um, then the products have less energy than the reactants. So I just want to like starch low and then it ends high. Which one did you say? So that would be when it starts low and then it ends high. That would be photosynthesis. So yep. that would be endergonic. Yep. And then a catalyst, any substance that increases the rate of the chemical reaction because it lowers the amount of energy necessary. So the hill would be shorter or flatter if there was a catalyst presence present, so lowers the activation energy, and catalysts are reusable, so they can work again and again and again and again to power the reaction. And enzymes are type types of catalysts, but they're biological. They're typically made of proteins. Um, so that means that they're controlled by your DNA. So a mutation in your DNA means a mutation in an enzyme, and then um, maybe that enzyme won't work as quickly. Um, this is just a quick reminder about how enzymes work. Whoops, my... Everything is on a little bit of delay, I think. I should have restarted my computer, so sorry if it's going to be choppy. Hopefully not. Um, the whole idea of enzymes, that's what the gray puzzle piece is here. Those are the enzymes. And then the substrate is the molecule that the enzymes are working on. They pull it apart or put it together. Um, so the shapes have to fit together. So a mutation in DNA could cause the enzyme to have the wrong shape and then it won't be able to catalyze this reaction anymore. So the reaction won't work correctly. That's just one example of something that, that could happen. Okay, and then environmental influence. There are three major environmental conditions that affect enzymes. Um, temperature, pH, and then how concentrated anything is. So the concentration of the enzymes, the substrates, any cofactors, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so take a look at the temperature there. And notice that there's a peak for the temperature, and then it slows down with colder temperature. But with high temperature, what can happen? With a really high temperature, what can happen? Denature, right? Which totally breaks the hydrogen bonds and changes the shape of the molecule. Um, the same thing can happen with pH, and let's just practice that really quickly. pH is a measure of what? This is so hard. Hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions. Very good. pH is a measure of hydrogen ions. And so if you have more hydrogen ions than usual or less hydrogen ions than usual, then you're going to end up with um, changes in the shape of that protein. And so that could affect whether that enzyme works very well. The other thing I'll mention, that last graph, um, I want you to just think about the enzyme activity. 
Um, the enzyme is going to go faster and faster and faster the more substrates there are until there are so many substrates that every enzyme is busy and then we're going to see a leveling off. So we're not going to see it go faster and faster and faster because all the enzymes are busy working on substrates. So that's why it levels off. Okay, and then moving on, um, competitive interactions and non-competitive interactions. Competitive means it gets in the way of the substrate. So here's a competitive inhibitor. So a molecule that slows down the enzyme. If we don't want the enzyme reaction to be happening super fast, we can have a competitive inhibitor. Um, a non-competitive inhibitor could bind somewhere else on the enzyme, and that changes the shape. Remember, if you add... Remember, this has been a long time. If you add a molecule, if you attach a molecule to an enzyme or a protein, it has its own chemical structure and it's gonna affect the structure of the protein. The protein is gonna bend or move in reaction and then it's not gonna have the correct active site um, to meet up, that correct shape to meet up with the, um, with the substrate. Okay, and then over on the other side, um, showing allosteric, talking about allosteric, let me get my image out of the way there. Oh, it failed. I can't get my image to move. Okay, I guess my image is stuck there. Allosteric is um, not specifically um, in the active site itself, but means somewhere else. So there's an activator in the first one. Um, the activator, if it's present, it causes the shape to be correct so that it can do the um, reaction. But an inhibitor, when it's present in the allosteric site, can cause a change in the shape of the protein and then it doesn't work anymore. So different types of um, ways of controlling the reaction itself. Okay, for some reason, nothing is working. This is my going really slowly. I'm pressing all my buttons and nothing's happening. There we go. Oh, it gets to me really slow. I should have shut down my Chromebook, so sorry about that. Okay, first and second laws of thermodynamics. Just reminding you, matter, matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, but they can be transformed. Um, so organisms use energy from the sun or from chemical bonds to do work. And work is moving atoms through cell processes. The second law of thermodynamics, um, we talked a little bit more about, that's where we were introduced to the word entropy, which is chaos. And we said that the universe is constantly heading toward chaos um, because everything is losing energy. So how is it that life has evolved to be so orderly? And that's because we're constantly taking in energy. We have to eat or photosynthesize as the case may be, but take that energy to make ourselves more complex. And when we stop taking in that energy, that's when we experience entropy and disorganization, and then that's death, okay? Cheerful thoughts. Okay, so then um, the, the concept of coupling, um, if you put a reaction that gives off energy, AKA an exergonic reaction, if you couple that with, an, with a reaction that needs energy, um, you can make the one that needs energy work. So we put them the two together, and basically that's what they're showing you here, is that if you put the two together, um, if you have a less stable molecule, it has lots of energy capacity, and you can use that um, to do work, and then it'll end up having, being more stable, but then having less energy or less able to do work. Okay, and then hydrolysis of ATP is the breaking up of ATP. Um, so hydro means water, lice means to break up. Um, so energy from catabolic reactions, cats break dance, so that's breaking up things. Um, so those are exergonic energy releasing processes like cell respiration. Um, that energy is used to power the synthesis of ATP from ADP and phosphate. So here's ADP and we're gonna add a phosphate and the energy maybe that you got from eating food is now used to build this high energy molecule. And now that high energy molecule can be used to do other work in your body. And remember the way that it does work, we remove of that third phosphate and that it's like a super high energy bond and it releases energy and that energy can be used to do work. 
Um, so the hydrolysis of ATP is used to pow power the anabolic reactions like photosynthesis. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on. Was there a question? Just scratching um, the back of your head. Well, the ADP plus phosphate plus energy is endergonic, right? Say it one more time. So to, make, to make the Yes, ADP. yes, okay. endergonic. Making ATP is endergonic. You have to add energy to that system in order for it to go. Okay, so metabolism just is a word that sometimes is a little bit fuzzy for students. So um, it refers to the sum total of all chemical reactions that take place in an organism. Um, so for example, all the breaking down of foods and turning it into ATP would be examples of metabolism. Um, if a metabolic product is not needed, then we have um, enzymes that can do feedback, so positive or negative feedback, to control how much of that reaction happens. We don't want to be doing all kinds of reactions if we don't need them. So negative feedback allows us to shut it down and conserve energy. The whole idea is to conserve energy. We don't want all of our reactions going all the time. Okay, enough about enzymes. Let's jump right into um, photosynthesis. Um, remember the difference between chemoheterotrophic and photoheterotrophic, um, photoautotrophic, sorry. Photo means light, auto means self. So these are making their own food from light. Chemoheterotrophic means you have to eat. So chemoheterotrophs eat, photoautotrophs make their own food. The inputs of one are the outputs of the other. And then we know that these reactions are um, reciprocal. We know that plants don't need us, but we need plants. Where can plants get their CO2 from? Volcanoes. Volcanoes, for example, a forest fire, for example. They don't need us to supply their CO2, but we need them for their glucose and for their um, oxygen that they're producing. Okay, so where does photosynthesis first arrive on this planet? How does that happen? Um, the idea here is that there is a type of anoxygenic photosynthesis, which means no oxygen was present, um, that bacteria were doing, it, and it happens under anaerobic conditions, and it doesn't produce oxygen, but it's sort of the precursor of photosynthesis. And then oxygenic photosynthesis arose about 2.7 billion years ago, um, and we think it came from cyanobacteria, which are still present today. There's still such a thing as cyanobacteria. Um, and this is called the great oxygenation event, um, when all these cyanobacteria start making so much oxygen that we actually get this oxygen-rich atmosphere. Um, keep in mind that we have just the right amount of oxygen on this planet. What would happen, you know this, what would happen if our oxygen level was too high, right? Lightning bolt and our, our uh, atmosphere would vanish. So it's really quite a remarkable thing that we have just the right amount of oxygen. Cyanobacteria are believed to be the ancestors of chloroplasts, and we'll talk about that endosymbiotic theory again coming up very, very soon, but not yet. Okay, um, so just reminding you about a few things, pigments and light absorption. So the graph on the um, left that we're looking at is called an action spectrum. Actually, the one on the bottom is the action spectrum. The one on the top is the absorption spectrum. So you can see what... Um, light wavelengths each molecule can absorb. And so if it's high, it absorbs it. If it's low, it doesn't absorb it. Um, and then we combine them all together to form what's called the action spectrum, which is the graph down on the bottom. Um, and so you put them all together and we notice that there's not, we have a dip at 550. Why is there a dip at 550? What was that? Yeah, that's green light. It's not capable. Those pigments are not capable of absorbing green light. And again, that's why plants look green typically. If they look a different color, there are some plants that have purple leaves. Um, that means that they have different types of pigments in their leaves that are reflecting at different um, wavelengths. All right. And then just a quick reminder of redox. Um, reduction, reduction and oxidation, those can be confusing terms and they're not too bad, but they just, if you don't think about them, um, you'll forget them. So in chemistry, a redox reaction occurs when electrons are transferred from one molecule to another. So remember, reduced means that it gained electrons. Why do we say it was reduced then? because electrons have a negative charge. So the overall charge went down even though it gained electrons. 
So the molecule that loses electrons has been oxidized. And then importantly, hydrogen ions often will follow the electrons. So if the electrons go somewhere, they're negatively charged, then the positively charged hydrogen ions are attracted, and so the hydrogen ions will follow. And we'll see that very clearly um, during photosynthesis and cell respiration. Notice in the, um, in the equation, look at carbon dioxide and how it says it's been reduced. Follow the arrow over. It's really hard to see the electrons because we don't show you the electrons, but what did get added to the carbon dioxide? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Okay, they followed the electrons. And so that's how we know that it was reduced, that that was the molecule that was reduced and the water was oxidized. Okay, so a quick overview. There are light dependent and light independent reactions in a chloroplast. So really look at the diagram for a second and just remind yourself, the chloroplasts are the green disks. The light goes in and it hits the, um, the stack of thylakoids. So this, um, each one is called a granum. Each stack is called a granum, the thylakoids here. Um, and that's where the light reactions are happening is in the membrane itself. Um, and then notice a few things. Water is going in and it's being split reminding you of a few things. So the hydrogens are getting taken away, but the oxygen is getting released from the water. And so that's where the plants are making oxygen. Remember that plants make oxygen, so they're doing that right here. And then the hydrogens that are being taken off and the electrons, they're being carried by NADPH over to the Kelvin cycle, which is the light independent reactions. And in the light independent reactions, we're gonna absorb carbon dioxide and then put the carbon dioxide together with the hydrogens to build glucose, molecules of glucose. Um, and it's a cycle, it'll keep repeating around and around and around. Okay, so water is split, electrons and hydrogens are transferred to NADP+, light is converted to chemical energy, ATP and NADPH are formed, you see that right here. And then in the light independent reactions called the Kelvin cycle, um, the electrons are transferred to carbon dioxide and we build glucose molecules. All right, and then just a quick reminder why um, some of this happens. These electrons are being released and they're going down an electron transport chain very gradually so that their high energy is absorbed very slowly. Sam, you should go get a drink of water. Just help yourself. Because you'll be mad at yourself if you fall asleep. Well, get up. I like walk or something. Just help yourself stay awake. But anyway, it's all on a record, everybody, that Sam was falling asleep here. <laughs> it's all in our video. Okay. Um, so again, we're trying, we're trying to release the energy of these electrons very slowly so that we don't waste the energy, like throwing a match into a gas tank would waste the energy. Instead, we use spark plugs that release just a little bit of that energy at a time and we can do a lot more work with it. Okay, so what's happening in the light dependent reactions? You never have to have this memorized. You have to understand it. They will give you this diagram if they're gonna ask you a question about it. You just need to be able to look at it and understand what's happening. Easier said than done. Um, so just to remind you what's going on, photons, a photon of light comes through and it ejects the electron. So here's the electron, it's getting ejected. You see it going up in photosystem two, and then it gets carried through, um, ETC stands for the electron transport chain. And as it goes from one protein to another, it's losing energy. And that energy that it's losing is being used to pump hydrogens into the inside of the thylakoid. So hydrogens are, we're getting a high hydrogen ion concentration. So what's the pH in here if it has a high hydrogen ion concentration? Remember this, okay, high hydrogens, low pH. Low hydrogens, high pH, so opposite. Um, so that's a low pH on the inside of the thylakoid. Good. Um, so then another photon of light hits photosystem one remember they're in backwards order photosystem two was discovered photosystem one was discovered before photosystem two but a photon of light hits here ejects an electron so the other electron is able to replace it 
And this electron then um, gets captured by NADPH and some hydrogens get captured. And we're going to deliver those to the light independent reactions in just a moment. Um, we've pumped all these hydrogens. There's additional hydrogens from the, um, from the breaking down of water. I should be clicking through here. Water is split to replace the missing electron. So remember, an electron got ejected. What replaced it? It replaces this electron. What replaces it? The splitting of water. And so we have additional hydrogen ions that are in here. And then the release of oxygen. That's where the plant is making oxygen for us. Um, and then those hydrogens come back through through an enzyme, uh, a cell membrane enzyme or a thylakoid membrane enzyme called ATP synthase. And as they pass through, the, the turbine turns. Do you guys remember that it actually rotates? And it brings the ADP and an inorganic phosphate together to make ATP. All right, so the light independent reaction. Now we um, are sucking up, the plant is sucking up carbon dioxide. You can see that up here. That's called carbon fixation. Where is my, there it is. Carbon fixation is happening up here. It's rubisco is the name of the enzyme that's grabbing it. So that's called carbon fixation. And then reduction, make sure you understand that technical term. We already mentioned it once. What is to re be reduced mean? Adding electrons. So reduction is gonna be happening. And then we regenerate the process so that it can cycle around and around and around. So I'll give you some details on that. ATP and NADPH get used up in the process and a three carbon molecule, you're gonna see it in just a second, gets made every one turn. So how many turns does it take to make glucose? Two turns, because glucose has six carbons. Glucose has six carbons. Okay, so let's do a quick, um, carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere by the enzyme rubisco, that's right there. It is combined with other carbon molecules to eventually produce um, molecules like glucose. ATP is hydrolyzed to power the whole process and NADPH drops off its electrons and hydrogens, reducing the carbon molecules. Okay, and then hopefully everybody's got this now. Where does the dry mass of a tree come from? Carbon dioxide, right? So the air, fine. Just don't say the soil. Don't say the roots, something like that. Okay. Um, and where does the mass of a tree go if it's burned to the ground? Back into the air again, right? So a bad thing. Okay. Um, cell respiration, opposite process. It's catabolic. We're breaking glucose down to make ATP. Um, it's giving off energy. So that's great. That's the whole point of it. Um, and we couple exergonic reactions with endergonic reactions. So we're going to break down um, glucose so that we can build ATP molecules that can then release energy for us to do whatever we need to do, all the athletic events that we all do, no, whatever. Okay, um, so overview of the whole process. I think sometimes these overview pictures are really the most helpful to kind of give you the big idea. Um, so respiration begins with glycolysis. Glycolysis is nothing more than the breaking of glucose, breaking it in half. So it becomes from a six carbon molecule, it becomes a three carbon molecule. Um, if there's no oxygen present, then we kind of stop here and that turns into what we call fermentation. If oxygen is present, then the process can continue on into the inside of the um, mitochondria. So anaerobic respiration um, is fermentation, which we'll talk about. Aerobic respiration requires, um, requires the oxygen to be present. Um, it happens in the mitochondria or in the folds of a prokaryote. Remember that the folds, the whole purpose of the folds is to increase surface area because lots of these reactions are happening on the proteins that are on the surfaces. And the more surfaces we have, the more of these reactions can occur. Okay, so then um, the pyruvate gets transferred in. We remove a carbon dioxide and we have acetyl-CoA. It enters into the um, citric acid cycle. Electrons are carried via NADH and FADH2 to the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. We'll see that in just a second. If all those terms are terrifying you, don't worry. Um, and hopefully we make about 30 to 36 ATP. It depends in, um, 
Animals that have to heat themselves, we might make less ATP if we're releasing some of that energy as heat. Okay, so glycolysis, not a whole lot to say here, just breaking up glucose. So take a look, here's glucose. We cut it in half, so now we have two pyruvates. Um, look at the diagram, you'll never have to memorize it, you just have to understand these things. Um, it says that two NAD pluses are reduced to NADH. That means that they've grabbed some of the electrons and then some hydrogens have come with it. Um, so we're gradually pulling the glucose molecule into tiny little pieces. We're pulling it all apart. And every time we pull it apart, we get some of that energy from it. And that we're pulling it apart slowly so we get as much energy as possible. Okay, and if there's no oxygen present, then we're going to go into fermentation. And that's what this is. Fermentation is really wasteful. Um, we don't pull all of the molecule apart. So a lot of the energy stays um, still there because we can't pull it all apart. So two examples of fermentation that you all have heard of, um, the one that happens in yeast, which is um, what causes bread to rise. If you've ever made bread, it actually has an alcohol smell to it. Um, the carbon dioxide bubbles, that's what's making the bread rise. So a little bit of carbon dioxide is made. You can see the carbon dioxide right there. Um, and then what happens in our own bodies if we're exercising too hard or something terrible like um, lung cancer, asthma, um, we're not getting oxygen to our bodies. We can go into lactic acid fermentation. Um, we can get a little bit of ATP from the process, but not enough to support a, a large multicellular organism. Um, so lactic acid fermentation, the good news is that it's reversible. Um, so the lactic acid can then enter back into cell respiration once oxygen is back in our body. So if we slow down our exercise or if we're able to breathe again well, um, we can get all the energy out of that lactic acid that um, was present. Okay, so assuming that oxygen is present, um, the pyruvate that was cut um, during glycolysis enters into the mitochondria. Um, one carbon dioxide gets pulled off, and that's part of why we exhale carbon dioxide. We're, we ate glucose, and now we're pulling the carbon dioxide off of the glucose. Um, and then NAD, NAD plus is formed, um, sorry, NAD plus grabs onto electrons to form NADH and H plus. And then it enters into the citric acid cycle where two more carbon dioxides are released. Um, there is a new electron transporter that you're not used to called FAD. And that becomes important in just a moment when we get to the electron transport chain because it's not as efficient as NAD is. Um, and one ATP gets produced. That's So I told you it's going to be 30 to 36 ATP. Where is all this ATP being produced? It'll happen in just a moment. So the kind of the purpose of this cycle is to be making NADHs and FADH2s. That's the purpose of this cycle. They're collecting hydrogens and electrons, and they're going to drop those hydrogens and electrons off here at the electron transport chain. So what, to, what your eyes should see, you don't need to memorize, but what your eyes should see, NADH drops off its electrons earlier than FADH2 does. So NADH, its electrons push through one, two, three hydrogens into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. So that's where the pH is low. Um, whereas FADH2, its electrons only push through one, two hydrogens. So they can't, it doesn't make as many, FADH2 doesn't make as many ATP molecules as NADH does. Um, so NADH is a preferred molecule. Eventually they squirt through over on this side through ATP synthase. That's called chemiosmosis. Um, the whole process is called oxidative phosphorylation. And then just to remind you, the electrons that are zipping through here, they're going to be caught by oxygen. Um, I, I often said it was like a catcher's mitt and the, the electrons were like baseballs and the oxygen is catching them. If the oxygen isn't present, then the entire system backs up and we start doing lactic acid fermentation or um, if it's the yeast, doing um, ethanol fermentation. Um, as soon as the oxygen is present, then the whole process can move forward again. 
Um, that's what we're talking about. Water is a waste product, which is kind of a funny thing to say. It's the best waste product ever. Um, so at the end where the oxygen has caught the hydrogens and the electrons, we've formed um, water, which is awesome. And then it's all recyclable. So the FADH2 that dropped off its stuff and the NADH that dropped off its stuff, now they just go back um, to the um, beginning of the cycle and start all over again. So it's awesome. And I mentioned chemiosmosis already. That's passing through the ATP synthase. And we're not going to watch this. A little video you could watch if you wanted to. And then just a quick reminder. So this is the same image, only it's in black and white. It's the same image that we have been looking at. So look at the, wrap your brain around it. Here's NAD, dro NADH dropping off its electrons. Here's the hydrogens getting pushed push through. They didn't show you FADH in this case, FADH2. They didn't show it dropping those off. That's fine. Um, but the hydrogens are getting dropped off here, and they're supposed to come through ATP synthase to make ATP. However, sometimes we let some of the hydrogens through on their own, and I wish I could move. I don't know why today I'm not able to move my image. Whatever. Um, it says heat back here. So it says heat right there. So heat is released if we let some hydrogens back through without making ATP, and that's what warms our bodies. And that's what also makes us less efficient. So we have to eat more food in order to be able to heat our bodies. Um, animals that are ectotherms don't have to eat quite as much. Yes? Um, what if, if we just surround ourselves in a space that's exactly like 98.6 degrees? For our entire lives, would there be a problem? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I would guess that you would get to eat less food um, if you were at the right temperature all the time. You would still be producing some heat for sure. Um, just ATP, anytime you burn ATP, literally, no, not literally, it's figuratively burning ATP. But when we're using ATP, it's an exergonic reaction. And so it releases some heat automatically. So just by living, your body is going to release some heat. Um, so maybe 98.6 is a little bit too warm. If you cooled it down a little bit, then you would maybe find the ideal temperature. Yeah, but that's running on your work with the outdoor temperature. Okay, and then the other thing that I just want students to make sure they're always aware of is that Obviously, we don't eat just glucose. I make it sound like all we eat is glucose, um, but you ate a pizza that had fat and it had carbs and it had protein. Um, can those be added to the system? And the answer is yes. Um, you can see over here, proteins are added in. Um, they join in the system. We just don't teach you specifically how proteins are added in, um, but it's a whole process of enzymes and it's controlled by enzymes. Fats can enter into the system as well, and they all end up going through the citric acid cycle and doing making ATP oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, and then again, this is just the idea that every step is mediated by enzymes, and if we want to stop the process, we can do um, positive or negative, depending, um, uh, feedback for them. So it just depends what's going on. Why do we need it? Okay, everybody, that is it for that unit so that's unit what did we say three and now we're going to go ahead and do let's see if my computer can keep up with me oh it's working um now we're going to do unit four which is cell communication and the cell cycle and i think that this one's a little bit shorter so i'm hoping i'm on time i am having trouble why is it not working oh come on do you see that the slideshow is grayed out? I don't know why. It's like it's not, there's no slideshow here. There we go. It's just loading. So I should have shut down. I'm asking my computer to do way too much. Poor thing. I'm hard on my computers, you guys. You would not want to be a computer for me. I am just saying that. It's a hard life, right? Okay, give it a second here. I should have had you get up and run around the room for a moment. I know, right? I know how to have fun. <laughs> All right, cell communication and the cell cycle. Moving on. Quick, click. Let's go. Click. Come on. Sorry, we're trying to hurry and it's going slow. Trying its best. 
Oh, computer, we don't have time for this. All day. I know you just want to sit here for as long as humanly possible. There we go. All right. Hopefully this will work. Okay. So I wrote down on this slide, know everything on this slide. Do you see I wrote that? I think this is, I think this slide makes a really hard concept good enough. If you understand what's happening here, I feel like you've got it good enough, but we're going to go into a lot more detail than that. So um, remember, a ligand is a signal, and it can be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Um, hydrophobic ones can pass through the cell membrane. Hydrophilic ones have to add touch onto a surface receptor. So what I want you to remember are the letters R, T, R, reception, transduction, response. So this is how cells communicate with each other, how they send mess messages and how they respond to those messages. So a message is called a ligand, that's the signal, and it has to trigger some kind of a response in the cell. So in this case, it was a hydrophilic it, um, ligand, it bound to the protein, the purple protein. When it binds, what happens to the protein? What, what is the attachment? Yeah, it causes the protein to change shape. In particular, it changes shape on the inside of the cell, which triggers a whole series of events, other proteins, other things. It gets um, amplified. It becomes this enormous response to one ligand. That's called transduction. And then eventually it gets to whatever it's supposed to be doing. So in this case, we'll talk about what some of the responses are. Does anybody remember a possible response? Uh, cell, suicide. cell suicide is one. Apoptosis would be one example of a response. Mitosis is another example of a response. So, okay, you guys are doing awesome. We'll, we'll practice those in just a second. So you're doing awesome. And then remember that changes in DNA can change these protein receptors. Um, so it can affect anything, a protein right here, a protein in, in the transduction process, or a protein involved in the response. A change in the DNA can change any, any of the process. This is an example, just really quickly, this is like a white blood cell that's recognizing another cell. Um, so in this case, the ligand is this green thing. You all see that? This green um, surface um, protein is the ligand, and it touches the receptor, leads to the transduction of the message, so the movement of the message into the cell, and then it's going to lead to some kind of a cell response. In this case, it would be triggering the immune system to attack. That's an example of a local cell reaction. Okay, and then the GPCRs. Um, doesn't matter that it's how vision and smell are transmitted, but just take a look at the diagram. Just see if you can make heads or tails of what's happening in the diagram. So this is our ligand. It touches the receptor. The receptor changes shape, which causes this protein, which was attached to it now to move away. And it's using GTP in the process, which is similar to ATP. Um, you don't need to know much about GTP. It's just another form of energy. So just don't let it scare you when you see GTP. Same thing, in essence. It's not exactly, but close enough. Um, then when it touches this um, adenyl adenylate cyclase, um, that triggers the formation of a second messenger. Do you remember the word second messenger? Um, cyclic AMP is an example of a second messenger. Do I care a whole lot about it? No, you just need to understand that what we're doing is we're taking a message from outside the cell and things are happening on the inside of the cell that are moving that message from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell where the cell can eventually respond. And that's what's happening in 5A, B, and C. Um, it's telling you kind of the things that, that are responding, how the cell is responding to that. Okay, and then um, another example of um, what's happening. So here's our ligand, and it touches a, um, a gated ion channel. So it's closed currently. And when it touches it, that causes, triggers a change in shape of the protein that opens the channel. And now the molecules can pass through. And if the ligand goes away, then the gate closes back up again. Um, so the cell those can lead to the cell response.
Okay, and then um, second messengers, the one that we hear about the most is cyclic AMP. It's just something that's gonna keep passing on the message. So here's the production of cyclic AMP. And really all you need to understand is that it's continuing to, to do the message to be passed on from, um, that's the part that's called transduction when it's um, moving on. Okay, and then amplification, again, don't make it scary, make it really easy. To amplify something means to make it bigger. So this is where you have one ligand, one ligand to start with. And as it goes through this cascading event of the, tran the transduction part of the process, more and more and more and more molecules are getting triggered. Like literally millions of molecules are getting triggered at one time from this one ligand. And that allows the cell to respond super fast to one, um, one triggering event. And so then it leads to a humongous response, whatever that response is. And we talked about that, what possible responses are. And so now, these are things that cells respond to, light, changes in temp, presence of hormones, et cetera. And these are the ones that you should be comfortable with. Um, they can turn a gene on or off. That would be a response. It can um, activate or inhibit an enzyme. That would be a response. Mitosis or meiosis would be a response. Apoptosis would be a response, so forth and so on. Those are examples of cell responses, okay? Here's an example that you've all heard of, um, epinephrine. Um, epinephrine is polar, so therefore you should be able to tell it's polar because it's using a, a channel, using a protein instead of being able to pass through. Um, it uses a GPCR protein so here's your second messenger and it leads to the yellow shows us the cell response and there's two responses and see if you can make heads or tails of that the inhibition of glycogen synthesis so glycogen is a big polysaccharide let's back up what is a polysaccharide what are we talking about many sugars that are put together so it inhibits making glycogen. So what that means is that it stops putting all those sugars together. So instead of storing the glucose, you're not going to be storing glucose anymore. It also promotes the breakdown of glucose, glycogen into glucose, so that you have energy to escape, to do fight or flight or whatever. So that's what that process, those are the responses that it's having. Okay. Um, and then um, take a look at this kind of scary diagram and see if you can make heads or tails of it. So we've got normal colonic epithelial cells. So that's your colon. And here we have colon cancer cells. So notice here there's a mutant. That's a difference that we're looking at. APC has a mutation. And what it's causing is the beta, uh, the beta catenin it is supposed to get broken down. It's supposed to be degraded. That's normal, but it's not getting degraded here. And so it's actually triggering mitosis. It's causing mitosis to happen. And that leads to cancer because it's uncontrolled cell growth. Okay, um, negative and positive feedback, just a quick reminder. When the stimulus is received in negative feedback, the response is to decrease. So it stops a condition that is detrimental. So take a look. When the body temperature gets too high, the response is to lower the body temperature. When the body temperature gets too cold, the response is to raise the body temperature back up again. That's negative feedback. So you're trying to return it to a normal level. Positive feedback is the opposite. Um, positive feedback amplifies a condition that is advantageous, so it keeps happening more and more and more and more. So childbirth is the example. Um, once the baby's head starts pushing, it releases the, um, the, the um, hormones that cause the contractions. And the more the contractions happen, the more the baby's head presses. So the more the hormones get released to, to continue the contractions and so forth and so forth and so on until the baby is actually born. So that's a form of positive um, feedback. Okay, and then we need to talk about mitosis. Why do cells divide? 
there's kind of several main reasons that cells divide, divide to replace damaged cells so that we can grow. So an infant growing into an adult is going through mitosis and then asexual reproduction. So just like um, skin cells go through asexual reproduction or bacteria go through asexual reproduction. That's um, mitosis. Okay, and then the cell cycle, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. So interphase, that's the part we're gonna talk about right now, has kind of four um, or three interphase is this blue area. It has three sections, G1, S, and G2. S is probably the most important. That's where your DNA gets copied. So that's where your chromosomes go from being monovalent to being bivalent. And you need that in order for the cell to divide. And if they're not bivalent, you're gonna start running out of DNA and that would be all terrible. Um, so the cell grows in G1, the DNA gets copied in S and then the cell prepares for cell division in G2 and then the different stages of mitosis. And it's a cycle, so it goes around and around. There is a G naught stage. Um, some cells stay in interphase, for example, the cells in the nervous system. Um, they never ever go back into growth and reproduction. Um, some cells can go back and forth from G naught, go back into it if they're needed. Um, so it just depends. And then it's called, I hate these words, they're so, sometimes your brain just doesn't wrap around them. You, they're easy words, you just have to think non-reductive. In this case, they're saying you're not reducing the amount of DNA. Different than the word reduction that we were talking about with electrons, different use of the word reduce. Um, so meiosis, you reduce how much DNA. Remember that sperm and egg have half the DNA. That's reductive cell division. This is non-reductive cell division, so the amount of DNA stays the same. So if I have 46 chromosomes in my skin cell, I'm going to have 46 chromosomes in my two new skin cells. Um, and that's happening in our somatic cells and whatever. I don't know why I'm looking up there. I have it right in front of me. Yes, everyone, it looks like a butt. Okay, we remember that. Um, animal cells can pinch in. So that's what the cytokinesis is, is when it's pinching in. But plant cells, because they have a cell wall, they can't pinch in. So it forms a cell plate um, in between the two new nuclei. And that's how the cell divides. Um, it says cells should only divide at certain times. They have um, a whole bunch of checkpoints that they have to pass, which is just a really crazy concept. Um, and if they pass the checkpoint, then it means that they're a healthy cell and that they can continue on division without, or moving on healthily. Healthily, is that a word? Um, but if they don't pass a checkpoint, then they either get repaired or they enter into apoptosis. Um, so failure to pass the checkpoints stops cell division and may even trigger cell suicide. Okay, and then the G1 checkpoint determines if a cell should replicate its DNA. And then if yes, the cell enters the S phase, and if not, it goes into G0, and it just, that's what senescence is. Um, if cells have stopped dividing because there's things that are wrong with it, <coughs> then they go into um, G0, and senescence is really what aging is. Um, our cells have stopped renewing themselves, stopped replacing themselves. Okay, and then um, this is kind of a hard one just to remind you of it. Um, so if you look at the, the colors up at the top, mitosis and then G1, S, G2. So this is the stages of interphase and then cell division. Um, so as the level of MPF increases, that's what triggers mitosis. And then those levels fall back down again and we're in interphase. And then those levels start to increase and we get mitosis and then those levels fall back down again. And then you can see it more visually here. Um, so it's called mitosis promoting factor. CDK is always here. So this is CDK. It's, a, it's an enzyme that's always present. Um, and then the, the cell starts making something called cyclin, which is this purple molecule here. And when the purple molecule and the orange one come together, it makes what's called the mitosis promoting factor. And that's what triggers cell division. So here it is, here's cell division. When they come together, it triggers cell division. And then immediately when the cell divides, the cyclin is broken apart, it's degraded. The CDK is still there in a constant amount. It never stops. 
but the cyclin levels increase, 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 and then they decrease, and then they increase, 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 and then they decrease. Okay, getting close here, you guys. Apoptosis, programmed cell death. The cell is sacrificed to prevent spreading of its mutations to new cells. Involves cell shrinkage, blebbing, love that word, and fragmentation. Mutations in cancer cells inhibit or stop apoptosis, so that's a problem. So you're supposed to have these stop signs that stop cancer, <coughs> but cancer cells have broken the stop signs, and so they make it through the checkpoints. And cancer cells are basically immortal. Oh my gosh, look at that, you guys. I got through 10 minutes early. That wasn't so bad. Okay, questions before we go? Okay, so Nick? like your cells stop dividing when the telomeres. <coughs> right? Yeah, the telomeres, which we didn't talk okay, about. Okay, so if you just have longer telomeres, would you live longer? Yes. So why don't we just like genetically engineer people that have longer telomeres? Why don't we? Like cancer? Cancer. Like because then the cells can divide more and more and more and more and more and more and more, and, more and then you would be more like, until we can cure cancer, we can't either protect telomeres or lengthen telomeres. So, but if the telomeres were longer, they wouldn't have to protect them because they degrade over time, right? They just naturally degrade at the same speed, but they'd be longer, so they'd degrade for a longer period of time before yeah, the cell would get That's what I thought, but then I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, and then I was wrong. Um, I'm not sure, Nick. I'd have to think that one. Telomeres are not part of the AP um, requirements, so you guys don't need to know about telomeres. So. Okay, everybody, that's it. We're going to stop the recording. Telomeres are a government Everybody just heard that. Now they know the truth.